Okay. Hello, everyone. It looks like people are settled in here. Uh, we can go actually go get, get go ahead and get started on the hour. Um, welcome, everyone, to uh, to University Hospitals uh, Medicine Grand Rounds. Today we're thrilled to welcome uh, Dr. Peter Wayne, who is the Bernard Osher Associate Professor of Medicine in the field of Complementary and Integrative Medical Therapies at Harvard Medical School, and he serves as a director for the Osher Medical Center Integrative Medicine, jointly based at Harvard Medical School and Brigham Women's Hospital. Today, Dr. Wayne will present Tai Chi for Whole Person Health, Evidence for Benefits to Balance Cognition and Pain in Older Adults. This presentation is brought to us by University Hospital's Connor Whole Health, as part of the Rebecca and David Heller Mind and Body Lecture Series. We are so grateful to the Hellers for their generosity, making the series possible and allowing us to welcome experts in the mind-body field, like Dr. Wayne, to share their knowledge and, and experience with our residents and other providers. Dr. Wayne is a researcher and practitioner in the field of integrative medicine. The primary focus of Dr. Wayne's research is evaluating how mind, body, and related integrative medicine practices clinically impact aging and chronic health conditions and understanding of the, uh, the physiological and psychological mechanisms underlying observed therapeutic effects. He has served as a principal uh, or co-investigator on more than 25 NIH-funded studies. His research has evaluated the impact of therapies such as Tai Chi, acupuncture, and chiropractic on diverse medical issues including balance disorders, Parkinson's disease, heart failure, cancer, back and neck pain, migraine, uh, migraine headaches, and healthy aging. Dr. Wayne has more than 40 years of training experience in uh, Tai Chi and Qi Gong and is an in, uh, internationally recognized teacher uh, of these practices. He is the author of the medical, Harvard Medical School Guide to Tai Chi, which has received an award of excellence in the medical communication by the American Medical Writers Association. And with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Wayne uh, as our speaker today. Well, thank you, Dr. Gishwani, for the very kind introduction, and thank you to Dr. Don and others for the invitation to present. I'm really grateful for the opportunity today to share some ideas and research findings related to Tai Chi for whole person health and healthy aging, which I believe will dovetail nicely with the mission and some of the activities that are going on already at the Connor Center. Of course, I wish I could have participated in this event in person, and have been able to visit with uh, your team and with others at Case Western um, and my colleagues and friends there, but I'm glad that we can leave le leverage this platform and stay virtually connected during these uh, very unusual times. So before beginning, I'm required to disclose that in addition to doing mind-body research at the Harvard Medical School, I also oversee a community-based Tai Chi program in the Boston area. So I think as most of you already know um, in this audience, beginning in the 17th century, but especially in the past 150 or so years, medicine has been greatly influenced by reductionism. That is a way of seeing the world which believes that complex phenomena, uh, including health, can be best explained by analyzing increasingly simpler components, basing building, basic building blocks or mechanistic processes associated with a system. Reductionism has supported the evolution of medical specialization and organ-based medicine, which of course for those who become seriously ill or in need of an, the expertise of a cardiologist or an oncologist or a neurologist, we're really, really grateful for. Um, in more recent years, reductionism has begun to drill even deeper and led to great insights into subcellular genetic and molecular levels, um, leading to remarkable breakthroughs in precision medicine for cancer, cystic fibrosis, among many, many other conditions. However, it's my guess that um, the majority of the people in this audience today also appreciate that there are costs or side effects to reductionism in specialization medicine, namely the fragmentation of our patients or individuals um, and the way they are cared for into disconnected parts and processes with less of an appreciation for the body and their care as a whole. To use an ecological metaphor, um, sometimes reductionist medicine um, sometimes doesn't see the forest for the trees. So at our OSHA Center, and I believe at the Connors um, Center, and I think increasingly throughout the integrative medicine community, integrative medicine is now being seen much more than co-locating acupuncturists and pain clinics or stress management people in a, a heart um, health clinic, but rather integrative medicine is about treating the whole person and enhancing the connections between their parts. And from this more holistic or systems biology perspective, or even an ecological perspective, which is depicted in this diagram here on the right from a 
textbook on Chinese medicine, health is believed to emerge from the rich crosstalk and the complex dynamical processes and interactions between physiological systems. And fortunately, uh, an appreciation for this way of viewing and studying whole person health is now front and center at the National Institutes of Health's National Center for Complementary and Integrative Medicine. And it's front and center in the new strategic plan, which if you haven't had a chance to look at it, I highly recommend it. Um, key themes in this plan that I think are relevant to my talk today include that um, analysis, which you can think of as reductionism, the breaking things down into parts, and synthesis, or putting Humpty Dumpty back together again, so to speak, uh, are not necessarily um, antagonistic processes or, or alternative ways of doing things. They can be quite synergistic, and together um, they can create a lot more information than, than either paradigm alone. And that synthesis um, or systems sort of integration research, which has received a lot less attention, is gonna require that we begin to understand this crosstalk that I've mentioned uh, between the different organism, organ systems, and especially what we commonly refer to as uh, the, the interconnections between mind and body. And with that being said, this agenda and this, this perspective offers a particularly unique role for studying multimodal mind-body therapies, um, such as Tai Chi for maintaining and restoring health and for understanding how these interacting components underlie whole person health and healing. So with that sort of conceptual framework and overview, what I want to do in the next 30 minutes or so is talk about Tai Chi um, that has evolved as this multi-component mind-body um, integrative exercise. I think specifically to target these different parts of systems and to synergize um, how they create uh, emergent health. I'll give you an overview, a sort of 5,000 foot overview of the research evidence on Tai Chi. Many of you may be quite surprised at how much um, evidence-based uh, information there is on Tai Chi at this point. I'll say a little bit about Tai Chi prevention for prevention because in integrative medicine, uh, we're very interested in upstream preventative strategies in addition to rehabilitation. But the research there is limited, but some of the work is quite provocative. And I'll focus much of my talk on looking at how these mind-body interactions um, in Tai Chi uh, impact a couple key issues in health and aging, especially <clears throat> relevant in our aging population. And those center around falls and cognition and chronic pain. So probably most of you have seen some Tai Chi or many practice it, but probably good to start with a general definition in our lab we use the definition that it's a mind-body exercise. We know it's rooted in a number of Asian traditions, including the martial arts, traditional Chinese medicine and philosophy. Um, it integrates slow, intentional, circular kinds of movements with breathing, and importantly, a, a variety of cognitive skills and training, including heightened mental focus, um, interoceptive awareness. It uses imagery, visualization, goal setting, those sorts of higher level cognitive processes. And the overall goals of these practices are to strengthen, to uh, relax, make people more comfortable in their body, functionally integrate the body and mind, and through that improve health, self-awareness and development. And at some levels, Tai Chi is also practiced as a martial art. This diagram here gives you um, a sense of the multimodal nature of this intervention. Um, and I won't have time to really unpack each of these, um, but we at the top, you can see Tai Chi is a physical exercise. It's moderately aerobic um, at its highest levels, kind of at the level of brisk walking. But there's quite a bit of weight bearing, musculoskeletal work, uh, strengthening flexibility. We're not just concerned about strengthening a part of the body, the bicep or a quad or a particular joint, but how all of these fit together. So dynamic structural integration and biomechanics and uh, kinesiological issues are really important. There's lots of cognitive pieces. You can think of almost um, Tai Chi as being mindfulness on wheels. It's taking these principles of being aware, relaxation, uh, focused attention, mindfulness, and bringing it into functional everyday activities. Intention belief is really important here. We, we visualize, we imagine we're rooted like a tree or that we can flow like water. And we know from good work and embodied cognition theory that what we think in these images and even the names of these exercises um, impact our physiological and biomechanical states. Um, breathing is a key piece of most of these internal practices. 
Um, social interactions are really important. We're starting to appreciate that um, at the societal level with loneliness, but most of these practices happen in groups and there's a rich dynamic that happens as, as these cohorts and studies or communities develop. Um, what some of my friends call the special sauce. And we're beginning to, to sort of study the, that emergent property of being together. And then there's this sort of embodied philosophy, you know, don't go 110%, maybe 70 is enough or go with the flow or eh, don't let that bother you. Um, these are important for martial arts, but they're also important for every activity and everyday activities. So each of these are potentially therapeutic ingredients. So you can think of this as a, a multi non-pharmacological intervention. Um, and this gives you a sense, uh, I'll be coming back to falls, but just how this complex intervention hits a complex issue. And in, in the case of falls, this list here lists some of the risk factors for falls. So sarcopenia, reduced muscle strength, these are all supported by very strong randomized trials that Tai Chi can affect these individually and sometimes multiple factors have been measured. Sensory deficits, for example, plantar sensation with aging goes down or with neuropathy or, or some chemotherapy-based neuropathy. Um, tai Chi seems to enhance the proprioception in the soles of the feet, which feeds back to balance. Coordination, you'd imagine, would go up and there's some good studies on that. I'll be saying more about cognition um, and different aspects of it. The affective piece of fear of falling which is ironically one of the biggest predictors of falls. Tai Chi seems to work through that um, as well as executive function. And there's more. But the key thing I wanna say is that compared to a pharmacological intervention, let's say um, SSRI that targets a very specific receptor and then affects change from that point out, this is like a multi-drug intervention hitting multiple receptors in the body and affecting it in a much more systems or ecological way. So it's really thinking of, of sort of co-opting the concept of whole person health in a sort of ecological intervention way. So there's quite a bit of literature on Tai Chi. This is um, a map of some publications just over the last 10 years that a um, colleague of, of mine and, and I've participated in the study of bibliometric analysis. Um, in the last um, 10 years, over 750, 730 publications. I'd say to date, there's about 1500 solid peer reviewed scientific articles. Um, this gives you a sense of where they're being published. This next diagram here gives you a sense that there's some hope that the quality of these, these publications are going up. This blue line here represents randomized trials. And you can see that over time, at least in the last couple of years, the proportion of studies that are randomized trials have gone up. And so there's a bit more rigor. That doesn't mean all this research is good. There's a lot of crappy research, not just in Tai Chi and integrative medicine, but all kinds of um, medical research. But um, by and large, I think there's some good, uh, robust evidence out there that we can lean on for advising our patients. This gives you a sense of uh, the areas that are most commonly studied. Anything with an asterisk here means that not only is there a good randomized trial, but there's a solid systematic review or pooled meta-analysis um, in support um, of this. Uh, sorry for the typo here. Um, and um, what you can see is um, a lot of work's been done in, in the area of balance um, in fall prevention. There's some good work in cardiovascular areas, osteoarthritis, some pain conditions I'll come back to, um, cognitive function, um, et cetera. But there's um, quite a bit um, in a lot of different areas. You'll notice a lot of this is focused on older adults, not as much information on middle-aged or younger adults. So what do we know about the safety? Um, it's a big part of the evidence. Uh, by and large, um, our systematic review and some others that have come out more recently suggest, even though there's incomplete evidence, that there's very little um, concern for serious adverse events, um, but there's no free lunch uh, with, as with any exercise or you know, significant intervention. In this case, uh, musculoskeletal aches and pains are not uncommon. Okay. Um, so I want to say something about prevention. A big part of traditional East Asian medicine and integrated medicine is to try to catch things upstream. This is a quote from something that goes back to um, nearly a, a century BC, um, and it's from the Yellow Emperor Classics. Um, and it says, to fight a disease after as it occurred is like trying to dig a well when one is thirsty or forging for a weapon once a war has begun. 
So there's a great emphasis in using Tai Chi um, to keep people strong throughout the whole life course. Um, this is one of the few studies that I know of that gives you a sense of the potential um, long-term effects in terms of uh, all-cause mortality. This is from the Shanghai Men's Health Study. There's both a men's and women's health study. Both of these large epidemiological studies are based, I believe, at Vanderbilt University here in the US. Um, this is a cohort at this time that had close to 60,000 people in it. And it was followed for these uh, seven or eight years. And uh, what they were, it was about a third of the people in this study um, were doing Tai Chi and Qigong. So you can only kind of do this sort of piggybacking um, in these Asian societies where there's a high prevalence of, of these practices. A third of the people um, were doing uh, walking or jogging or more physical exercise. And a third were quite sedentary um, and not doing physical exercise. And these are the uh, risks of um, the hazard ratios um, in terms of uh, cancer mortalities and cardiovascular deaths. And what you can see, there's about a 21% reduction um, in mortality uh, for cardiovascular disease um, um, and about the same for, for cancer. Um, when you combine both Tai Chi plus walking in the cancer domain, there's a closer to a 45% in all cause mortality. So this is provocative. It's, op it's observational and correlational. It's not causal, but nevertheless, it, it's robust data. And I think that there's an opportunity to piggyback some of these other large cohort studies in Asia um, to address some of these questions. So what I wanna do now is just shift a little bit to the um, experimental work we've been doing and talk a little bit about Tai Chi um, for enhancing balance and cognition. And these are two really big public health issues as, as everyone in this audience probably appreciates. I think most people know that about one out of three adults over the age of 65 um, each year fall. And that results in, in significant um, morbidity. Um, people who have a, a spinal fracture or hip fracture, one out of five of those may die within a year due to the sequelae associated with that fracture um, and the, the changes in lifestyle. Um, and it, in addition to you know, significant uh, burdens to them and their families. Um, this is a huge cost for um, society, estimated at 32 billion in, in 2015 and uh, close to 55 billion in, in this recent year, just for managing the costs associated with falls. Um, the epidemiological data for cognitive impairment and dementia is even more striking and alarming. Um, it's estimated that more than 10 million people over the age of 65 have early stages of cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment. Um, 6.2 have formal diagnoses of Alzheimer's and 11% or more have at least some kind of, of mixed dementia or uh, any of these categories. And the costs for this are staggering, <clears throat> um, estimated to be um, over 355 billion uh, in this last year. And the approaches that the geriatric community and medical community are taking to dealing with these two big public health problems has not been very integrated, okay? So if you complain about some physical uh, limitations and some concerns about your balance, <clears throat> you might be sent to a physical therapist or to a physiatrist. <clears throat> you might be recommended some strength and flexibility training, a little, maybe agility, some stamina training. <clears throat> Conversely, if you complain about some mental uh, limitations, you start having a little lapse in memory or forgetting things, you might be encouraged to do some cognitive training, um, some puzzles, learn a language, do some social activity, or maybe some counseling. Unfortunately, um, there's you know the pipeline for good, good meds um, for dealing with cognitive decline are not very promising. Some big trials have recently been quite disappointing. And there's certainly not a pill that we could take to, to not lose our balance and falls. The key thing I wanna say here is that these are not really independent. What we're learning is that things as simple and everyday as walking, but certainly in terms of maintaining balance and cognition uh, require both bottom-up and top-down processes that, that both. And what I wanna share is, is really good literature. And the, the summary for this slide here um, is that 
how you move really affects how you think in the short term and your long term risk of dementia, and how you think greatly affects how you move and your risks of falls. And so it just brings home this idea that we want to think of the whole person and the interconnection between these processes. And that might help us improve our ability to treat either one of these, but also to treat the whole system um, in the process. So this, um, this, there's some good evidence. Most of, most of you all know where the executive function is, that, that domain of cognitive function that helps you with task shifting, goal setting, um, and, and just monitoring things in general. And what good epidemiological uh, research has shown as well as experimental research is that people with intact cognitive function, in other words, no, no at all evidence of any cognitive decline or dementia, but those that have a modest level of dysfunction and executive um, function um, have a 44% increased risk of falling. So how you think greatly affects your risk of falling. Okay. What's really interesting to me is also the converse. And let me just walk you through this slide. There's a construct called the motor cognitive risk um, metric, and it's commonly used in primary care um, around the world now, increasingly. Um, and it really just comes down to two questions. Your, your physician or whoever is interviewing will ask, do you have any complaints about your memory? Yes or no, not a, complex battery of, of questions, just yes or no. And can you walk and they'll time your distance to walk a certain set of meters and compare that to normative data. Um, and so you get di uh, classified as a normal walker or a slow walker. So at baseline here, it's a robust sample of about 27,000 people. Um, these, women, these men and women were over the, uh, at 70 years of age or older, had no signs of dementia based on really good clinical testing. What you can see over time is this cohort develops dementia, going back to that epidemiological data, it's quite alarming. Here, these people in the top blue line have, have reported no complaints about cognitive function and walk at a normal speed. But you can see even they, that group has about a 25% um, occurrence of dementia. This green line here are people who had cognitive complaints. Sorry about that. And what you can see here is having a cognitive complaint increases your risk of dementia 12 years out by about eight or so percent. What I find really interesting is that people with no cognitive complaints but walk a little slower or are at greater risk of dementia 12 years out. In other words, walking slower is a better predictor of future dementia than early cognitive complaints upstream. And of course, the two together um, have the highest um, risk of dementia. So how you move, um, and as simple as how quickly you, your, your gait speed is, um, is a predictor of long-term dementia. And so this, this appreciation for the interdependence of cognitive motor processes is catalyzing how we think about prescribing um, interventions for adults. Maybe they should be doing Sudoku puzzles while they're on a treadmill to train both cognitive and motor function. And in reality, that's what's happening. Um, so these are some examples of dual task training. This is an older gentleman who's doing some strength and balance exercise while he's doing some cognitive task here, identifying um, numbers or, or symbols. This is a more gamification version. Um, some of you may recall back to playing Dance Dance Revolution or some other games where you have to move your body in response to prompts onto different um, <clears throat> uh, mats here. And then there's even virtual reality, very high tech, where this gentleman is monit being monitored in terms of balance as he navigates um, different challenges or follows um, different cues in this virtual environment. But in addition to these sort of more modern high tech approaches to mind-body dual task training, um, there's old school approaches. And this is where Tai Chi comes in as something that way back realized that it's important to be training these processes at the same time. And so I wanna talk a little bit about um, how Tai Chi impacts falls, um, talk about the interaction between the anxiety, the affect and fear of falling and the risk of falls, um, cognitive function, especially executive function and falls and how Tai Chi affects the two. And then looking at these um, interactions um, during gait 
And so the take home message for falls is that Tai Chi is one of the better tools we have out there. Um, the Cochrane, uh, a somewhat dated Cochrane review now um, suggested when it pulled all the studies that there's about a 30% reduction for fall risk and that it was good, as good as any other program that was out there. More recent uh, robust meta-analyses suggest about a 20 to 43% reduction um, in falls. And some of uh, these benefits have been shown to um, take place in, in unique populations such as Parkinson's disease, stroke, and, and high-risk fallers. And I'll show you an example of one of these. Um, this is a study by Fu Zhang Li, um, who's out in Oregon. It's a robust study. It was published in JAMA, JAMA Internal Medicine. It compared a, a version of Tai Chi um, Chuan or Quan. In this case, it's called Tai Chi for Better Balance um, to a multimodal exercise that included strength training, resistance training, a little agility and flexibility training to just seated um, flexibility training. So you don't get some of the benefits of the balance. So this was the, the control. It was a, an intervention that lasted for six months and they had six month follow-up. Um, what they found was quite striking uh, compared to the control stretching, the Tai Chi at six months had a 58% reduction in falls. And when Tai Chi was compared to this other multimodal exercise, um, it was 31% um, better. Um, so uh, benefit, great benefits. What's really interesting in the long-term follow-up uh, especially for serious falls, which are the most costly to individuals and, their, and society, there was still a 75% reduction. So this is a training that keeps working through the system even after the, interve the formal intervention has ended. Um, what's interesting is Fu Zhang Li's group's also done some implementation research. He's taken this program, he brought it to 35 senior centers in the Oregon area. Um, the program lasted 48 weeks. It was adopted. There was uh, a good participant compliance and adherence. And what they did is they replicated uh, the uh, observation that there's a consistent reduction in falls in this study, uh, close to what they saw in the trial, which is 49% after a year. Okay. So now I'd like to just say something a little bit more, of, like to, to look under the hood. What is it that's going on in these interventions um, that makes it so effective. And I think one of the areas is this interaction between affective processes and, um, and motor processes. And most of you are aware that uh, an older adult, and I think about 50% of adults who had a fall um, develop what's called fear of falling. Many adults who haven't fall, fallen but have balance issues also have fear of falling. And it's a horrible, vicious cycle. You develop this anxiety, this fear of falling. You can see how this woman here is guarded. You, she may be holding her breath or bracing her body or be distracted. Um, and that, that, that anxiety um, limits their desire and their skill at participating in activities of daily living and physical activities and shopping and socializing. That reduced activity then uh, feeds back on weakness and uh, loss of confidence and reduced mobility, and then that makes them more fearful. And it's a vicious cycle, and it's hard to break. And what we've learned is that um, Tai Chi is one of the best things out there for fear of falling. You're not just training the physical system, but you're monitoring affect. You're, monitor you're being mindful. You're noticing how anxiety makes you squeeze your neck or hold your breath. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> good meta-analyses support that um, Tai Chi reduces fear of falling by about 35%. And I think even more generally, and this will come up when I talk a little bit about pain, um, it's a very accessible, gentle exercise for deconditioned people. So we're starting to think of it as a gateway exercise. It makes people a little bit more comfortable in their body, a little more confident that gives them self-efficacy uh, self um, and I think then they're more likely to do other activities in addition to Tai Chi. Um, <clears throat> there's some good evidence on Tai Chi for cognitive function. Uh, we did a review. Um, I'm sorry, I, I pulled up the wrong slides. I'm, I'm just gonna acknowledge that. Um, I updated these and I just pulled up the wrong file, but this is close enough. So when you see add new reps, there are just minor changes, but I, I can fill you in on these. But this has been updated recently. There's a few new 
systematic reviews, but by and large, what the evidence suggests is that there's um, uh, good evidence for Tai Chi improving executive function, which we learned before is really important for cognitive motor interaction. And there's some evidence that it's um, good for global cognitive function, including in populations that already have um, mild cognitive impairment. This is an example of a, of a robust study that was it's a little dated now, um, but it gives you an idea of, of the ways that um, cognition is affected. This is looking at 120 older adults. They all had normal mini mental uh, state exam scores. Uh, the four groups that they were randomly assigned to included Tai Chi, aerobic walking, social interactions, and uh, no in intervention control. It's robust in that there was a good dose of the intervention over the course of 40 weeks, so a nice extended exposure. Um, and this is what the uh, study found, was this is an overall dementia, in dementia index. A higher value here means a better cognitive function. And you can see the Tai Chi group really outperformed all others. There were some benefits for social interactions, which also happened in the Tai Chi group. Executive function was measured through the uh, trail making test. And it's basically how you toggle between numbers and letters. So the faster you go, the better your executive function. You can see Tai Chi outperform things. And here there's um, even some evidence that there may have been some structural changes over these 40 weeks in terms of brain volume. There's um, not as much research um, on what goes on in the brain uh, following Tai Chi and Qigong interventions as there is in meditation and some of the good acupuncture research, but there is growing evidence that what we're seeing clinically correlates with changes in um, various neural networks and structural changes in different parts of the brain, especially in the hippocampus, as well as some of the um, um, important um, biomarkers such as brain-derived neurotropic factors. Um, so these are correlated with some of the clinic benefits, but this is an area that, that's just growing and, and warrants some more attention. But I did want to highlight this uh, new study that just came out, tiny study, I think it's from Lithuania, but it was done um, during COVID. And what it found was even after 12 weeks of Tai Chi training in the small group, they saw some significant changes in uh, brain-derived neurotropic factors, which are important for synaptic um, connectivity and neuroplasticity. So even short-term changes seems to um, be moving the needle on these hard biological outcomes. So I wanna say a little bit about the, the interplay between cognitive motor interference and how we study it in the laboratory. Um, and um, basically it comes down to the, what we call a dual task paradigm. And the question that we want to address is, we know that there's a cost to um, doing a second cognitive task while you're moving. For example, if you're on your phone texting while you're driving, you're much more likely to have a serious accident. There are people on their phones that walk off train platforms in New York um, and have you know, tragic accidents. But even shorter, uh, simpler things, if you're having an interesting heated debate with a, a friend while you're walking in nature, you're more likely to be distracted and trip. Or if you're looking at a a list of items in the supermarket. Um, so we know that there's a cost to, to moving and thinking. And most of the falls that happen in the world are, are out in the real world when people are engaged in cognitive activities. And so this gives you an example here of um, how we would study this. This is a woman coming into her laboratory. On the top panel, she's walking uh, without any cognitive challenge. On the bottom panel, she's counting backwards by, by threes. This is an older woman. And what you'll see, particularly when she turns the bend here, is this is in real time. She's walking faster in this top panel than in the slower panel. So the, the cognitive task makes her go slower. But if you look at the regularity of her steps, she's also um, much more irregular. There's more stride time variability um, in the lower uh, panel. And what we wanna know is if we teach this woman Tai Chi, when she's walking and counting backwards, will she look more like this upper panel? Can we harmonize this cognitive motor interference or, or coordination? And the short answer is yes. This is a study uh, led by Brad Manor, one of our postdocs at the time. He's now an associate professor here. And um, it's not a group of spring chickens. Um, the average age here is 85 years old. Um, some of these people um, 
uh, turned 100 in our study. It's a small study, but compared to um, um, time and attention match education control, after 12 weeks, those who did Tai Chi walked faster while they were counting backwards. So there's some evidence there. Um, this is a study looking at more healthy um, aging. This, um, this panel here is comparing a group of Tai Chi experts from the Boston area. These experts, um, as well as the um, naive um, comparison group of older adults were all very healthy. They weren't taking any meds. So hard to find people who are close to 80 not taking meds. They're all physically active in addition to doing the Tai Chi. Um, the Tai Chi experts were really experts. They had an average of 25 years of, of training. If there's a benefit of Tai Chi, we better see it from people who've been doing it for 25 years. And it's hard to do a longitudinal study for 25 years. So these cross-sectional studies give you some insights with caveats. And what we see is that the Tai Chi group here has much lower stride time variability. Their regularity in walking um, is much better um, when they're doing a dual task compared to the naive people. We can then take this naive group and randomly assign them to six months of Tai Chi. And what we see is that after even a short-term exposure, um, the people in the Tai Chi group, it's a small study here, um, but within the group, there was a significant movement towards looking like Tai Chi experts. We've also done this in Parkinson's disease, and we see this benefit of um, stride time variability. This is really important in Parkinson's. Um, freezing gait you can think of as the extreme um, irregularity in, in walking. And we know due to dopamine um, depletion and, and changes in, in networks in the brain that you know all, what, what we all appreciate as automatic movement is, is hindered. But with recruitment um, from other parts of the brain, and in particular executive function areas, some, sometimes associated with the um, uh, prefrontal cortex, for example, um, Parkinson's people, uh, people with Parkinson's disease um, can seem to compensate. And we think that part of why Tai Chi training is effective for this group and, and older people in general is because we're compensating for some motor issues with better paying attention and uh, top-down regulation. Um, and there's some really nice studies, some published in New England Journal of Medicine showing that Tai Chi reduces falls in Parkinson's um, patients and improves all sorts of aspects of quality of life. I think this is one of the mechanisms that we hypothesize. So I just wanna say a few more things about pain um, and um, the interactions between mind and body and pain. Um, my other slide, would have said that you know pain is such a, a big prevalent issue in society today. Um, and I apologize that these aren't clear, but I can walk you through them. Um, but you know, I think about 30% um, of older adults uh, you know, have chronic pain. It goes up with age. People who are over 65 really suffer with, with chronic pain. Um, and there's a number of examples of Tai Chi being good for pain. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is this sort of top-down, bottom-up um, interactions. Um, this is a study uh, by Chen Chen Wang here in the Boston area, the New England Medical Center. And this was a, an equivalency trial. She wanted to know whether Tai Chi was as good as the gold standard for treating knee osteoarthritis. And in this case, um, she compared it to physical therapy, which is the gold standard. And what you can see here for overall pain scores, function, um, <clears throat> and the global quality of life, uh, all associated with the Womack scale, that Tai Chi was as good, if not a little better. What I wanted to highlight here um, was that not only did Tai Chi help with these um, pain-related issues, but Tai Chi reduced depression in this population, which is often comorbid with chronic pain. And that was not um, the case for physical therapy. Um, this study is by Amanda Hall. Again, I apologize for the, the color here. Um, and um, what she found in her first study was that Tai Chi uh, was very good for back pain um, compared to a control group. It reduced pain by about 35% uh, and disability. What was really um, novel about a, a follow-up study was that she found that, that these top-down processes, mainly catastrophizing and also ruminating, um, 
were big mediators. So Tai Chi changed pain and pain changed bothersomeness of pain and disability, but about one third of the effect on pain intensity and two thirds of the effects on pain disability could be explained not by stretching and strengthening and good biomechanics, but what goes on in the noggin, these top down um, uh, cognitive processes. So again, Tai Chi seems to be affecting both of them and that might be making um, explaining why they're, they, they have some superiority over unimodal approaches. Okay. Um, this was a study of Qigong for persistent um, surgical pain. And um, this is a horrible condition. Um, these women not only have a diagnosis of, of cancer and then go through very invasive procedures of chemotherapy and um, um, radiation, but they also go through surgery. And most of them in, in our study had a bilateral mastectomy or many of them did. So they have a whole change in body image. The horrible um, situation for this group of, of women is that at the end of this, about 20 to 40% have persistent pain. And that pain is not just a, a contemporary pain, but it keeps them in the mindset of I'm a cancer patient. Is this the cancer coming back? Um, and so this is a multimodal pain. And what we wanted to look at was, can we take a multimodal intervention, in this case, a Tai Chi-like exercise called Qigong, uh, eight pieces of the brocade, and teach women in a group um, how to do this and see if we can change a whole bunch of the symptoms at the same time. And uh, the short answer is, it's a small study, um, uncontrolled, about 21 women, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> 12 week intervention, but we really seem to move the dial in a lot of different ways. We changed pain severity, pain interference, anxiety, depression. This is a lovely instrument <clears throat> called Maya, developed by Wolf Mailing at the University of um, UCSF in San Francisco, another OSHA center. And it's basically a really good measure of embodied mindfulness or interceptive awareness. And so some of the questions you might be asked um, in this instrument is, when I'm upset, do I take time to explore how my body feels or um, is, do I trust my body? Is it's a safe place? And what we saw, there were eight different dimensions to this. All of them changed significantly. Um, and I'm just showing uh, two of those as an example. We're also really interested in the relationship between body shape and affect. Again, this top down, bottom up kind of thing. And what, um, this is how we measure this. We bring people into the lab. We have really nice, sophisticated um, infrared cameras so we can get very detailed measures of angles of heads and shoulders. And what we were interested in is this sort of slightly slumped over shape that can happen with people with chronic pain and just chronic morbidity. And what we were interested and what we found was that those, um, there were some nice changes in how people carried themselves, these women carried themselves and that the change in the vertical angle of their head, this particular angle was correlated with the magnitude of changes in depression. Okay? So the point here isn't that um, changing how you hold your head affects depression or changing depression affects how you hold your head. The point we wanna make is that these are not, it's not optimal to think of these as separate, that these are interconnected systems and that multimodal approaches may be able to shift this, the system in an ecological way. And the women who participated in this reported um, this interconnection between mind and body exquisitely. They were so articulate. Um, these are some quotes from some of the graduates of the program. Um, I was able to pay attention, more, uh, more attention to my body. I'm trying to pay attention to where it hurts. Realizing when you get stressed out, your body can reflect that. It's trying to tell you something. This, this interceptive awareness. If something comes up that's stressful, I can actually feel my pulse accelerating, my breathing. I can then settle myself. Being aware of that gives them um, efficacy to take care of themselves. Um, a lot of these women said that their body betrayed them. Um, I needed to learn how to work with my body and not resent it and feel like it betrayed me. I was mistrusting my body and just thinking you let me down seriously. All this stuff was going wrong. Then I take these classes and discover actually this body is doing a pretty good job for someone who's been through what I've been through. So, and then this, this one, uh, I really love this quote. 
Um, how you feel about your body is a challenge after you've had breast cancer, but mind and body have to be interconnected. All of it connected in what we call Qigong mind body exercise. It relaxes you, helps you stretch out a little bit, calm you down, help you think about your body in a different way and trust your body to get inside yourself in a different way. It doesn't mean you're not gonna get cancer again, but it could mean that you're more at peace with your body. And if you don't believe those sorts of evidence, you can go back to some of the classics. This is um, from Schultz's Peanuts. And if you can't read it, I'll just read it for you. This is Charlie Brown saying, this is my depressed stance. When you're depressed, it makes a lot of difference how you stand. The worst thing you can do is straighten up and hold your head high because then you start to feel better. If you're going to get any joy out of being depressed, you've got to stand like this, okay? And so again, how your shapes, your, mo your moods, we've known this for a long time in these traditional wisdom tr practices that they're all interconnected. Uh, Charlie Brown even knew this. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that these interventions are so effective. So try to pull us all together. I think it's fair to say that Tai Chi is a promising intervention for enhancing lots of domains um, of health in aging adults, including balance and cognitive function and pain, as I shared today. And the multi-component um, nature of these mind-body practices, they're, the way that they work ecologically may afford unique advantages over unimodal therapies, but that makes it challenging to study. Um, and that I think it's clear that balance, cognition, pain, affect are all interdependent. And that interdependence supports a more integrative view of looking at um, health in a systems or ecological or whole person way. And also the value of studying mind-body therapies, um, not only to change clinical outcomes, but in this case, to start to parse out these different crosstalks, how mind and body come together. I think these become really good experimental tools to better understand how we all uh, work as a, a much more emergent system. Um, the work I've shared today is, is um, there's no time to thank everyone, but I'm a very small part of a lot of really um, exciting teams, people that I'm really fortunate to work with. I'm grateful for the support of NCCIH and also really grateful for this opportunity to share and for you guys um, for listening. So thank you. And I apologize again for my picking, hitting the wrong button um, to pick the, uh, not the most recent set of slides, but I think we made it work. Thank you so much, Dr. Wayne. That was excellent. Um, we'll, we'll actually have a, uh, some time for questions. We'll start with here in the audience if anyone has any questions here. If not, we have a few questions in the chat. All right, let's go to the chat here. So uh, we have... Um, a comment. Uh, so I was in medical school 40 years ago uh, at a time when uh, Engel's biopsychosocial model was welcomed and integrated into clinical medicine. I'm skeptical when I hear uh, someone make special claims to the dawn of a new age in medicine by wholesale criticism of reductive thinking and then deploys metaphors and words that sound fresh, ecological, integrative, precision, holistic, com uh, complementary, alternative, but are ill-defined. To me, this sounds like uh, the biopsychosocial social model uh, repackaged and then credentialed and monetized, uh, and then you can learn more here. So I don't know if you have any comment on that comment. Yeah. No, I think it's a very fair comment. I, I, sometimes I'll, I'll refer back to this. I think the biopsychosocial, and I think it's getting global, I think it's getting bigger, um, model is very, very similar to the ecological models of traditional East Asian medicine um, of the... Um, approaches of whole person health. Um, my main point is that by and large, um, while those models exist, there's a lot of emphasis on breaking things down to smaller and smaller pieces. Um, <clears throat> and there's great value to that. And I think there's less known about how the biopsychosocial model actually works. I think the model's there, um, but we don't know the physiology um, of how mind and body Inter interact. I mean, there's some, you know, there's been some basic stuff in early psychoneuroimmunology. I see Jeff Dusick is here and he did some work in that area. But by and large, we have no idea. We're just learning about how the gut and the brain connect, how the brain and the heart connect. We have great memory. We don't fall. Um, so um, anyway, what, what I, um, I, I, I fully accept that. I would say that we're not trying, in my case, I'm not trying to monetize this and own it and rename it. 
I'm just trying to utilize the resources that are around now um, uh, to further that agenda, which I think was a great start. So I, I appreciate that comment. Thank you. We have a we have a uh, we have a comment here. Uh, also, that someone has uh, raised their hand. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Dusick. Peter, great talk. Um, I seem to ask that question: as integrative health and medicine is looking to complement what may be symptom related or symptoms that are not well uh, cared for with current care, and my question was: is it the case that um, the Tai Chi you were showing was impactful after the disease state has already begun? improving cognition and physical state. And is there a kind of a, a sweet spot that the, like in a Parkinson's patient that they're at a point that they're early in their care or at what point would you um, want to intervene to retain or even to improve the symptoms that we see with Parkinson's, for example? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and then, you know, that's why I put the prevention slide in there. It's just an area that's so hard to study because, you know, how, how do you, you know, do interventions over long periods of time. Um, most exercise studies are you no know, more than a year. And what we wanna know is what's the effects of really long behavioral changes. Same with diets and complex interventions. So I think it's a really important question. In the case of Parkinson's, my, I'm gonna speak from clinical experience working with individuals and teaching in, in Parkinson's studies. The sooner you can begin these interventions, the better. Um, because you give them, you give the system more resilience to compensate. Um, I don't know whether we can completely change the course of the disease. Obviously, we can't, but we can slow down the progression. I think there's some growing evidence from exercise studies um, and other multimodal interventions, not just Tai Chi, that starting up upstream and having a diversity of of activities, not just Tai Chi, but boxing and uh, dancing and social interactions and cognitive tools and diet changes, um, those may be able to slow the, the course of progression and maybe even the trajectory and its ultimate severity. I think it might be different for other diseases. I think in more plastic diseases, metabolic diseases, cardiovascular diseases, um, diabetes, those things, I think you can catch, catch things sooner and really change the course. And I think you can bring people back into health um, from those in-between places. Thanks, Peter. Great job. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, someone else raising their hand, Dr. Uh, Francois Adnan. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I feel inspired not only for our patients, but for myself, frankly. Question for you is, do you have any information on Tai Chi for the pediatric population? Mm. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there's very little literature on it. There's a few very small studies of doing Tai Chi in grade school. There's a, 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 a larger but not satisfying set of studies in college students um, in terms of managing stress. A lot of these are done in Asia where you know it's required to be a, as a university student to do Tai Chi. And I think the um, I don't know how well those translate in terms of our cultures. There's, there's cultural differences, there's biological differences, et cetera. Um, what I would, my, my experience is, um, and having you know, children myself, um, some of the principles of Tai Chi are a little too slow. Um, uh, although lots of children um, really take to mindfulness if it's packaged in a good way. But there are exercises like the five animal frolics, these very traditional Tai Chi-like exercises where you move like a bear and you know, bear has a sense of stolidness and confidence or you're fierce like a tiger and your, your eyes bulge or you can fly like a crane and to bring the playfulness in. Um, and there are lots of these tools out there. I think we're gonna get more bang for buck if you meet your population at the level they're, they're gonna get this. But I also say paralleling that, there are lots of martial arts. So one of the sisters to Tai Chi are these traditional Shaolin Kung Fu systems, like the you know, Tiger Claw or Crane. And there are martial arts schools all around the country. It's one of the largest growing small businesses. So that would be incredibly translatable. And there's a small number of studies suggesting if you enroll young people into these 
programs, not only do you start to affect metabolic diseases and obesity issues, um, you develop some confidence, flexibility, cardiovascular health. So I think that's a very scalable thing that has been understudied. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there are some really good martial arts teachers that make kids bring in their report cards and, you know, there's a sense of respect and being part of a system. I think there's a, an underexplored um, opportunity there, but I would go there for young kids before, especially younger, younger kids, before I went to um, something as um, contemplative as Tai Chi. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Um, does insurance, uh, and I guess specifically Medicare, cover Tai Chi? Uh, and then the stationary bike does, does, does give the same benefits as what, uh, what the questioner asked. Um, so in terms of the second question, there's a couple studies that have compared not sedentary biking, but walking. Uh, we've done a study with um, um, heart failure patients, um, and we found that um, doing uh, aerobic, more aerobic exercise um, up the heart rate much more than Tai Chi. Um, but for some odd reason, at the end of, you know, six months of training, Tai Chi people had better um, exercise capacity based on the six minute walk. There's also some studies in Hong Kong that have seen that. So we don't know, we think there's different mechanisms involved in just the cardio involved in biking in place or walking um, compared to the multimodal nature of Tai Chi. I think they're both good. Um, uh, in terms of insurance coverage, unfortunately not yet. I think there's some select plans that will reimburse you for being part of a gym or an exercise program. And some people might be able to use participation in Tai Chi. It's recommended uh, for older adults by the CDC, the American Parkinson's um, Disease uh, Foundation, many other um, uh, organizations as well. Uh, but um, it hasn't elevated into um, widespread insurance coverage. And one of the challenges is with, and this shows up across many integrative disciplines, um, is that the credentialing is, is very different than becoming a physician or even an acupuncturist or massage therapist. There's no national organization that credentials people. Um, so there's a lot of pluralism and um, that's, and, um, and there's a lot of heterogeneity in the ways that Tai Chi Chip Tai Chi is taught even across trials. So um, the generalizability, um, I think, has slowed down this process of insurance coverage. I think we'll just do one more question. And, and that, I think it's a very important logistical question is where do we find a Tai Chi instructor, uh, whether it's for our patients or for ourselves? Yeah, I think um, most metropolitan areas have programs. Um, you know, in the time of COVID, it's interesting how quickly things have adapted in a lot of our studies where we're delivering interventions in person, we have pivoted and we've have been surprised at um, how easily it translates to online teaching. Um, some people, especially with significant morbidities and, and limited resources, really appreciate te learning from home in a virtual platform. And we're teaching somewhat simplified, easy to learn things. You know, you're not gonna become a martial artist um, um, doing these programs in our studies. Um, a lot of other places have gone online and how to pick your best one. I think it's the same that you would find a good healthcare provider, you know, ask around, you know, do you have a good recommendation for a new PCP or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a massage therapist and to try out a class or two um, often, you know, so because what works for one person might not be great for another person. Um, but there are lots of resources out there and increasingly quite a bit online for people who are comfortable with doing that virtual approach. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wayne. We really appreciate your presentation and you, and, and you uh, being able to speak to us here at Case Western uh, all the way from Boston. So thank you so much again. Oh, my pleasure.